Hello, it's Jim from JetsonHacks.com. On today's show, we are going to connect a serial peripheral interface device, commonly referred to as SPI, to a Jetson. I will show you how to use the new GPIO header configuration tool, Jetson-IO. After a quick demo, we have a more in-depth discussion on how this works behind the scenes when we explain and explore the device tree and pin mucks. You can think about adding SPI functionality in four different steps. We are using a Jetson Nano for our example. First, we need to wire our SPI device to the Jetson. Always make sure that the power is unplugged from the Jetson before wiring. Here's pin one of the Jetson Nano. It's towards the outside edge of the board. For this example, we are using an Adafruit 1.8 inch TFT display. The part ID is 358. I will leave a link in the description below for it. The spirit here is to give you a feel for what adding a SPI peripheral entails, not a comprehensive guide to using all SPI devices. We won't be covering the display much in this video, as the tutorials offered on the Adafruit website are quite excellent. Basically, we soldered header pins on the display breakout board and then wired the display to a Jetson Nano with the aid of a prototyping breadboard. Here's a quick and dirty wiring diagram. If you are using this particular device, you can pause the video here to help in your wiring quest. Step two. We need to configure pins on the Jetson to be able to access the SPI controller. We will use the new Jetson-IO utility to help us with this task. This is similar to the Raspi-config utility on the Raspberry Pi. After the demo of the display, stick around for a tech talk where we will discuss a little more in depth how this utility works. While Jetson-IO makes the GPIO pin header configuration conceptually simple, you just specify these particular pins as SPI, what happens behind the scenes is slightly more complicated. Let's configure our GPIO expansion header. On the Jetson Hacks Nano account on GitHub, there is a repository named SPI-Playground. This is more about following some directions that we have copied down here and we have some examples for this particular SPI display. The first thing that we will do is configure our SPI pins on the GPIO expansion header. Let's scroll down here a little bit. These instructions are taken from the official Jetson-IO guide. It's over here. Configuring the 40 pin expansion header. Exciting reading. There's more information here on how to use the utility. I'm using the Jetpack 4.3 release on the Jetson Nano. This initial release of Jetson-IO had a couple of issues. So let's fix those up. The first issue is an init issue. This was a common problem on all the Jetsons. Let's execute this. This is from the manual. The Jetson Nano also had another niggle. Let's fix that up. We have to make a new directory here. And copy over some files. Let's grab this. And they were copied. Now we are ready to configure the SPI ports. Another issue that Jetson-IO has is that it needs a large terminal window. So let's make sure our terminal window is a good size. And let's run the utility. Here's how all of the pins are configured in their default state. We want to configure the 40 pin expansion header. Let's take a look at the pinout on a Jetson Nano. If we go to the Jetson Hacks website, there's a section called Pinouts. We're on a Jetson Nano. Let's take a look at that. There are also pinouts here for the other Jetsons. We can see that the SPI pins are sitting down here on pin 19 through like 26 or so. 
If we go over here to the configure 40 pin expansion header, we can select SPI one, hop, hop, hop. And that's on pins 19, 21, 23, 24, 26. Just as predicted in our pinout. Carriage return to select and then back. And then we can save and reboot to reconfigure the pins. Any key to reboot the system. Carriage return. Step three. With the pins configured, let's talk a little bit about how to interface with them. Depending on your background, you may have heard the terms modules and device drivers. A simplistic explanation is that under Linux, we typically think of a driver as a program that interfaces with hardware. Modules are chunks of code that extend the functionality of the kernel. These modules typically load on a demand basis. Many device drivers are modules, but not all modules are device drivers. And some device drivers live in user space and are not modules. That's about as clear as mud, right? The device drivers may be general purpose, like let's say a USB device driver, or specific to a particular piece of hardware functionality. Let's take our example here. The Jetson talks SPI through a module called SPIDEV, which is part of the kernel. Note that in some cases, it may be necessary to build a module from source to make it available. Also, modules can be built into the kernel image itself or stored externally to be loaded on demand. With that said, the third step is to enable the appropriate kernel modules. In our case, because SpyDev is part of the kernel already, we don't have to do anything. Step three complete. Step four. In our case, enabling the SPI pins makes them available for business because the SpyDev module knows how to talk to them using SPI protocol. We might think of this as the SPI driver, but we still aren't talking to our display yet. Even though the display connects via SPI and can understand SPI protocols, it still needs a chunk of code to make the display actually do anything, like display an image or display text to clear itself. We can think of this as the display device driver, but note that it's outside of the Linux kernel space. In other words, there are two device drivers. One is for the SPI device. This is a Linux module. The second device driver is for the display and is in our user space program. In this case, the display driver is not a module. And yes, you could write a module that drives the display too. There are many examples in the kernel source tree like this. As you might guess, this can all be rather confusing. And this particular example is relatively simple as some modules bring in other sub modules to help support them. One of the reasons that people find this confusing is because it's confusing. Let's clone the SPI playground. Let's grab the address. And switch over to that repository's directory. Let's test out our SPI device. Let's go into the examples folder. And these examples are based on code written by Adafruit. Changed a little bit around, but not much. In order to get our examples to work, we need to install some prerequisites. Let's wander down here. We will need pip3. Then we will use pip3 to install Adafruit Blinka. Adafruit-Blinka uses Jetson.gpio to interface with the display. Next, we will load CircuitPython bus device. and the CircuitPython RGB display. 
And last but not least, we will install Python 3-pill, which is the pillow library. Now we are ready to run our examples. In our first example, we will display an image. Let's grab our command and execute it. It's a shark. Pro tip of the day, remove the protective film for an even better viewing experience. For our second example, we draw some text on the screen. These are some stats about the Jetson that refresh periodically. It's Tech Talk time! Time for a quick review. A Jetson development kit consists of two parts a Jetson module, and a carrier board. The Jetson module has a NVIDIA Tegra system on a chip, which you will see abbreviated as SOC. Both the Jetson Nano and Jetson TX1 have a Tegra X1 chip, the Jetson TX2 has a Tegra X2, and the Xavier's have Xavier Tegra chips. Each chip comes in various flavors, with differences being things like the number of CUDA cores and clock speeds. And boy, do they mean it when they say system on a chip. The idea here being that you can have an entire computer system on a single chip. You only need to add external memory and connectors. There's the usual computer system stuff, some of which we list here. Memory controllers, low speed peripherals, high speed peripherals, networking, and so on. What sets the Tegras apart from most other SOCs is that they have an onboard GPU. CUDA cores. Each generation of Tegra chips offer more functionality. The newer Tegra chips, like the Xavier's, offer a whole slew of supplemental processors on board for functions such as deep learning accelerators and vision processing. Lest you think these are simple machines, remember that an Xavier has 7 billion transistors. By comparison, an Intel i9-9900 has 1.7 billion. We can think of this in a different way. The technical reference manual for a Tegra X1 chip is around 3,000 pages. For the Xavier, 8,500. Obviously, we can't list all of the functions here in a reasonable amount of time. The next question is, how do you get all of this goodness to the outside world? There are more signals in the chip than there are pins on the chip package. Some of the pins are dedicated, but a large number of the pins are what we call multi-purpose I.O. or MPIO for short. MPIO pins can be assigned different signals. This assignment is handled by a data selector, which is called a multiplexer. The subsection of the chip which handles this multiplexing is called the pin mux which is short for pin multiplexor. It's programmable, of course. Naturally, there are rules to which signals can go to which pin. That's a whole thing in and of itself. The takeaway here is that you should be aware of the pin mux and know its role in the grand scheme of things. In order to complete the system, you plug the Judson module into a carrier board. The carrier board integrates the module along with any application-specific functions and connectors. For the Jetson Dev Kit carrier boards, this includes the usual suspects, such as display connectors, USB connectors, Ethernet, and so on. In our demo, we route SPI, which is referred to as a special function, to the appropriate output pins. The question is how? Let's jump up a level to the operating system. The operating system for the Jetsons is Linux for Tegra, which is abbreviated as L4T. L4T is derived from the Linux distribution named Ubuntu. You will hear people refer to this operating system as L4T or Ubuntu 
or even more generically as Linux. Now, a Linux distribution is built on the Linux kernel. As we talked about earlier, the Linux kernel talks to the attached hardware through kernel modules. The Linux kernel is a binary blob that a bootloader loads into Jetson memory when the machine starts up. You may hear about these bootloaders, their names are mentioned occasionally, in vboot, uboot, and cboot. While they are separate programs, and each Jetson version has a different boot sequence, which may use a different combination of these bootloaders, the task is the same. Start the machine, load the kernel, and hand off control to the kernel. Linux is a general purpose operating system. It doesn't have any hard-coded knowledge of the Jetson hardware. The kernel loads. Once the kernel loads, how does it know how to talk to the Jetson specifically? The answer is, there's a map to the hardware. This map is stored in a data structure called a device tree. The device tree tells the kernel how to use and manage all of the hardware components, including CPU, GPU, memory, buses, peripherals, and the Jetson-specific processors. If you are coming from a personal computer background, systems with an x86 generally do not use device trees. Instead, they rely on various auto configuration protocols to discover hardware. However, the Jetson, like most other embedded systems, use the device tree as a map to non-discoverable hardware. The device tree data structure is a tree of named nodes and properties. Nodes contain properties and child nodes. Properties are name value pairs. Here's what the source for the device tree looks like. This version is decompiled from the binary blob it might look funny in places. You can see the name value pairs and the nodes. The nodes are denoted by curly brackets. I have a GUI browser over here so that we can look at it in a little more orderly fashion. Here's the pair values that we talked about. For example, the name model matches up with NVIDIA Jetson Nano Developer Kit. And then we have nodes. Let's scroll down here a little bit. And there are all sorts of things in here. Here's the node that describes the CPUs. Let's look over here. You can see the correlation. Address cells 2, size cells 0, status. Okay, the Nano has four CPU cores. This describes each one of them. This is what the source code looks like. These are close to equivalent. Notice that these are in hex, these are in decimal. This is all pretty low level stuff. You can see the addresses of each of the controllers. Here's the four SPI controllers. Here's some definitions for the cameras. As you see, it's zero. It's for our IMX 219. Has all the camera modes here. 3264 by 2464. And it goes up to 1280 by 720. Has a whole bunch of information about it, kind of low level stuff. Default frame rates. This is 120 frames per second. All sorts of good stuff. In addition to loading the kernel, the bootloaders also load the device tree and tell the kernel where it is located. The device tree is kept in a compiled format, and on many of the Jetsons, the device tree is signed for security reasons and kept in a separate disk partition. Once loaded, the kernel uses the device tree as a map on how to configure the hardware and talk to it. Generally, there is a static device tree that is generated by the system designer. NVIDIA provides tools to help with generating the device tree. There are include files for the device tree in the NVIDIA kernel source code, which define the less dynamic parts of the system. These have the file extension .dtsi. Remember the pinbox? There's a spreadsheet called the 
PinMux spreadsheet, <laughs> which will help the designer assign the appropriate signals to each pin. Here's a representation of the PinMux spreadsheet. You have to run this on a Windows machine under Excel to get it to work with the macros. There are macros in the spreadsheet, which will generate the corresponding device tree from all of this information. The end result is the source code for the device tree. The file extension is .dts. This is a large text file as it describes the entirety of the system. There's a device tree compiler called DTC, which takes the text file and converts it into a format more appropriate for machine reading. The compiled file has an extension of .dtb. Once the kernel loads the device tree, it stores it on disk if the appropriate kernel flags are set. The Jetsons do this by default. The device tree of the running system is in slash proc slash device dash tree. Let's look at our device tree on disk. We'll switch over to the slash proc slash device tree directory. I have it over here in the file browser also. Let's go look at our friend, Mr. Pinmux. And here's our header 40 pin Pinmux here. This was from our device overlay. This is all in binary, so it's a little bit hard to browse this way. There is another part to this device tree family. Device tree overlays provide a way to modify the overall device tree. A device tree overlay comprises a number of fragments, each of which targets one node and its subnodes. These overlays allow optional external hardware to be described and configured, and they also support parameters for more control. The idea here is that you can describe and add extra hardware functionality to your device tree by writing an overlay which describes the hardware. After compiling this description, you can add it, or more accurately, overlay it on the device tree, which will then incorporate that functionality. The advantage of this approach is that adding new hardware is incremental. You just write a fragment that concerns the nodes you wish to add. You do not have to describe the entire device tree. Write them can see the fragment that we were talking about. This is a decompiled version. Some of the references might be a little mangled, but you can see that we created an overlay. Here is its name. Then it defines each one of the pins that was definable in the GPIO header. Pin three, pin five, pin eight. So for example, if we look at pin 23 here, this is its definition in the device tree. Let's go look at this in the device tree that we modified. We're looking for our friend, the pin mux. There it is. And then we wander down here, header 40 pin mux, just as we predicted. And let's look at pin number 24. And we can see that these two are the same. Here's one way to think about this. A device tree overlay is a small subset of hardware nodes that you want to add or use to supplement or replace current nodes in the device tree once it is in memory. This is exactly what Jetson-IO does, though there is an option to modify this static device tree to include these changes permanently. Lots of stuff here. As I mentioned earlier, this really isn't a definitive how-to guide. Instead, it's more of an introduction to the terms that you'll encounter during development and how they all fit together. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you have not already, please subscribe. Thanks for watching. Oh, I almost forgot. Stay safe. <laughs>